We all know that the Ryzen 9000 series CPUs are coming. And while we've already detailed what we know so far in another video, I actually wanna dive a bit deeper into the memory side of things because compared to Intel, the Ryzen 7000 series always had a point of contention when it came to memory speed and harnessing the sweet spot to get the very best performance. But will Ryzen 9000 be more of the same or maybe something better? Well, that's what we're gonna talk about. But before we do, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. Why is my computer sitting at almost 100 degrees? This can't be right. I even have the new Dark Rock that everyone was recommending. Um, that's not quite right. You want the Dark Rock series of CPU coolers from Be Quiet. What? You be quiet, you cheeky son. No, it's one of the most popular brands on the market, and they have products to suit all needs and budgets, including the Dark Rock 5 with six high performance copper heat pipes, dense aluminium thin array, and a 210 watt TDP. Wow, that sounds awesome, but I think my CPU is higher than 210 watts. Well, in that case, then they have the Dark Rock Pro 5, which features seven heat pipes and two Silent Wings PWM fans, and supports TDPs of 270 watts. This is sounding even better, but I have an i9 14900K, so I guess there's nothing for me. Firstly, how can you afford that? You're a child. And secondly, that's where the Dark Rock Elite comes in. It improves on the Pro 5 by increasing the second fan to 135mm for extra airflow and has that all-important RGB to make everything look better. Wow, that really does sound great. I'll head to the description right now and order one, but what do I do with this cooler? That's a rock. No, you rock. Thanks, Andy. The Dark Rock series from Be Quiet. Find out more by clicking the link in the description below. Now, before we dive into the Ryzen 9000 series, let's take a quick look back at AMD's history in terms of memory support. When AMD first introduced DDR4 with the first generation Ryzen platform, it faced some challenges with compatibility, stability, and performance compared to Intel, largely due to the immaturity of the platform and the complexity of the Infinity Fabric architecture that tied the cores together. Now, the Infinity Fabric was a novel approach that allowed AMD to create a modular, scalable design, but it also introduced new challenges in terms of memory compatibility and, of course, latency. Now, over successful generations, however, AMD made significant strides in improving memory compatibility and performance through a combination of improvements to the memory controller, the Infinity Fabric, and the overall platform, working closely with motherboard vendors and memory manufacturers to ensure better compatibility and stability, while also introducing new features like memory training algorithms to help the system find stable settings automatically, even though this can, at least on first boot, take some time. By the time that the Ryzen 5000 series launched, the official supported frequency reached DDR4 3200, with the sweet spot landing at 3600 CL16, due to the synchronous operation of the memory clock and infinity fabric clock. This one-to-one -one ratio at 3600 mega transfers a second, or 1800 effective, provided optimal performance by minimizing latency between the CPU cores and the memory subsystem, as the Infinity Fabric clock speed was directly tied to the memory clock, so running them in sync eliminated any additional latency from clock domain crossings. While some Ryzen 5000 series CPUs could achieve 4000 mega transfers a second in a one-to-one -one ratio, it was rare and required a highly bin sample because the Infinity Fabric Clock was tied to the memory clock, and not all chips could maintain stability at such high Infinity Fabric frequencies, with the quality of the silicon playing a very big role here, and only the best chips were actually able to harness these high speeds. Now, with the transition to DDR5 and the Ryzen 7000 series, AMD initially struggled again, with lower speeds and higher latencies compared to the competition, in part due to the immaturity of the DDR5 standard and the challenges in implementing a new memory controller, as DDR5 brought with it higher base frequencies, on-die ECC, and a new command bus, all of which required significant changes to the memory controller design. However, due to improvements to the Adjessa firmware, it allowed for better memory training, compatibility, and stability. And although the official supported speed tops out at 5200 mega transfers a second, speeds beyond that are possible through Expo profiles or even manual overclocking, with the sweet spot landing at 6000 mega transfers a second, CL30. Now, from our own testing, the sweet spot on Zen 4 based CPUs is 6000 mega transfers a second with a CAS latency of 30, which provides the best balance of performance and stability for most users. 
The reason for this limitation is the IO die or IOD, which houses the memory controller, PCIe lanes, and other IO functionality. The IOD is a separate chip from the CPU cores and is fabricated on an older, more mature process node, helping to keep costs down, but also limiting the maximum frequency of the memory controller itself. The IO die is connected to the CPU cores via the Infinity fabric, and the speed of this link is crucial for overall system performance. In the Ryzen 7000 series, the Infinity fabric clock or F clock is decoupled from the memory clock or M clock, allowing for more flexibility in memory configurations. But the IO die still has its limitations, which is why Zen 4 only officially guarantees support for up to 6,000 mega transfers a second. So what about the Ryzen 9000 series? Will that be much of the same, considering it's using the same DDR5 platform? Or will it be something different? Unfortunately, the answer is yes, it will be much of the same, as the IOD on Zen 5 is exactly the same as Zen 4, with no changes between the architectures, meaning that the memory controller will have the same limitations as on Zen 4, which is why there are only meager changes to Zen 5 supported memory speeds now topping out at 6400 mega transfers a second. While nothing has been confirmed as of yet, we do know that the integrated memory controller is similar to the Zen 4 counterparts, with a few tweaks here and there that allow for the slightly higher speed memory support. But with it, the new sweet spot is expected to be DDR5-6400, while still maintaining a one-to-one -one ratio between the memory clock and Infinity fabric clock, as this one-to-one -one ratio is crucial for optimal performance, minimizing latency between the CPU cores and the memory subsystem, and therefore giving the very best performance. Now, it is worth noting that running this at a one-to-one -one ratio does put some constraints on the Infinity fabric frequency, because in order to match the 6400 mega transfers a second memory speed, the Infinity fabric would need to run at 3200 megahertz, which is at the very limit of what's possible with the current architecture. And this is likely why AMD has chosen to stick with this ratio, as going beyond it would require significant changes to the Infinity fabric design. Now, while it hasn't been let's say officially confirmed, it's heavily rumored that some Ryzen 9000 series CPUs will feature AMD's 3D vCache technology, just like we saw with the Ryzen 7000 series. Though this won't be at launch and instead will come sometime later on. Now this technology stacks additional L3 cache on top of the CPU die, which can significantly boost gaming performance by reducing the need for the CPU to access main memory, as the additional cache acts a bit like a large buffer, holding frequently accessed data and instructions a lot closer to the CPU cores. In contrast, the non-vCache Ryzen 9000 CPUs will likely see more significant performance gains from faster memory, as they will be more dependent on main memory bandwidth, meaning if you're considering a Ryzen 9000 CPU without vCache, it will be more important to invest in a high quality DDR5 kit with fast speeds and tight timings, as the faster the memory, the more data can be fed to the CPU cores, keeping them fed and preventing stalls due to memory starvation. Now, if you're thinking of just being able to go out and slap in a faster kit straight off the shelf with this new lineup of CPUs, then sadly you're mistaken, as it's more likely that new kits from major memory vendors will be released to coincide with the Ryzen 9000 launch. And these kits will be specifically tuned for the new CPUs, involving setting the correct XMP or Expo profile, which contains pre-configured settings for frequency, timings, and voltages that have been validated for the specific platform that you're using. Now it is important to note that while the new Zen 5 lineup will work on X670E and B650E motherboards, there are no new chipsets launching alongside Zen 5. New chipsets are expected to come later after the initial Zen 5 launch, meaning early adopters will be limited to the existing motherboard options, which may not have, I guess, the same level of optimizations for the new CPUs as potentially future boards may actually have. Now, while we know that the 6400 mega transfers a second sweet spot is confirmed directly from AMD, there's not really been any word on CAS latency. And as we know with the Ryzen 7000 series, 6000 CL30 was that optimal combination. Now, speculating somewhat, but it's likely that with the increase up to 6400 mega transfers a second, we'll see the timings increase to a CAS latency of CL32. Though at this point in time, this is just really my thoughts, so take it with as much salt as you want. Now, the reasoning behind this is that as memory speeds increase, the time it takes for the memory controller to access a specific memory address also increases. So to compensate for this, the CAS latency must be increased to 
maintain stability. Now, for those who aren't content with just having the sweet spot and want to push things further, you will be entering, I guess you could call it the land of diminishing returns, as faster speeds may be possible, but will likely require higher voltages and more advanced configurations, typically reserved for manual overclocking, including adjusting timings, increasing DRAM voltage, and possibly increasing the SOC, or system on chip voltage, which actually powers the Infinity fabric and the memory controller themselves. However, going significantly past 6400 mega transfers a second while maintaining stability is unlikely due to the limitations of the IO die. Even with the best cooling and highest quality memory modules, the physical limitation of the silicon will eventually come into play, which is why even the most extreme overclocking attempts are just unlikely to yield what we would call daily drivable results, much beyond the official supported speeds. So the big question, why are AMD keeping with a one-to-one -one ratio and not pushing offset ratios more to the average consumer? Well, the beauty of keeping a one-to-one -one ratio is that much like what we saw with the previous generation, it allows AMD to leverage speed with lower latencies, which combined should lead to the very best performance possible, while also simplifying the memory overclocking process for the end user, as they don't have to worry about I guess finding the optimal ratio between the memory clock and the infinity fabric clock. It's more just a set it and forget it kind of thing. Now in an offset ratio configuration, the memory controller runs at a higher frequency than the infinity fabric, allowing for higher memory speeds. But again, it's at the cost of increased latency due to a asynchronous operation. And finding the right balance between speed and latency can be a pretty time consuming process requiring extensive testing and benchmarking. So I guess by sticking with the one-to-one -one ratio, AMD removes the complexity and just ensures that most users will be able to achieve optimal performance with minimal effort, essentially straight out of the box. However, it is worth noting that this one-to-one -one ratio may be less important for Ryzen 9000 CPUs with 3D vCache as they will be I guess less dependent on main memory bandwidth, meaning that these CPUs, I, I guess for the most part, will have a focus that may shift more towards capacity and latency rather than just raw speed, as having a larger pool of memory with lower latency can actually be more beneficial for these CPUs, allowing more data to be cached and I guess reducing the penalty of a cache miss. Now this could make for, I guess, some interesting memory configurations for Ryzen 9000 systems with 3D vCache, as rather than focusing purely on speed, users may opt for, I guess, larger capacity modules with tighter timings, even if they run at lower frequencies. For example, a 32 gig kit of DDR5 5600CL28 memory may perform better in a 3D vCache system than a 16 gig kit of DDR5 6400CL32. Of course, this is all again speculation at this point, and we'll have to wait for actual benchmarks and testing to see how these factors play out in real world scenarios. But I guess what I'm trying to say is it's an exciting time for PC enthusiasts with new technologies like improved DDR5 and 3D vCache shaking up the traditional balance of CPU memory and cache performance. Either way, I think I'm fair to say it's a step in the right direction for the red team. But with new CPUs and motherboards coming from Intel this year, the competition remains fierce. While AMD continues to make solid strides, particularly with the introduction of 3D vCache CPUs, Intel has also been pushing the boundaries of memory performance with their latest platforms. I mean, take for instance, Intel's 12th and 13th generation CPUs. They introduced support for DDR5, along with a new memory controller design that allowed for higher frequencies and lower latencies. They've also been working on their own version of 3D stacking technology called Faveros, which could bring similar cache boosting benefits to future Intel CPUs. But sadly, there's not really been any huge developments or updates on this since its announcement nearly five years ago, other than just, I guess, a few small discussions more recently. And when I say more recently, I'm talking about the last two years, nothing this year, at least from what I know. Historically, Intel has often been a step ahead when it comes to memory support, with higher official speed ratings and lower latency straight out of the box. This is partly due to Intel's tight integration between CPU and chipset development, which allows for more rapid adoption of new memory technologies. AMD, on the other hand, has had to rely more on external chipset and memory controller designs, which I guess when you compare the two, it can slow down the adoption process somewhat. 
However, AMD has shown that it can be competitive and even surpass Intel in certain areas, particularly when it comes to value for money. The introduction of 3D vCache, namely with the 7800X3D for example, has given AMD a significant boost in gaming performance, an area where Intel has traditionally held quite a strong advantage. Now, as both companies continue to innovate and push each other, it's the consumers who ultimately benefit from the increased competition and choice because that generally gives you more to choose from and generally speaking, does bring the price down a little bit. Now, looking forward, because that's what this is all about, I think it's gonna be interesting to see how the memory landscape evolves with future generations of Ryzen and Intel CPUs. And as DDR5 technology matures, we may see I don't know, higher speed grades become more common and more affordable, making high performance memory more accessible to the average user. At the same time, the increasing size of on-chip caches like with AMD's 3D vCache may also shift the focus away from raw memory speed and towards other aspects of memory performance. Latency in particular could become more important as the penalty for a cache miss becomes more significant with larger caches overall. So yeah, there's a lot going on. And uh, while some of this is speculation, there's definitely some things we can take away from the information that we've already been given. So there we have it. Let me know, what do you think? Will you be going with the new sweet spot of 6,400 mega transfers a second for your next Ryzen build? Or will you try to push things further? And if you're considering a Ryzen 9000 CPU with 3 dv cache, how much of a priority will memory speed be for you compared to capacity and latency? As always, we want to find out where your head is at. So let us know in the comment section below. That aside, hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do, then consider supporting us over on Patreon, where you'll get access to a whole host of goodies, including behind the scenes content, access to our testing data, bi-weekly game nights, meetups at the eTechnics offices, and much, much more. The link is, as always, down below. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.